Well, good afternoon. It's good to see the stragglers here, the, the diehards. It's an amazing conference, Stuart. If you can get people coming for workshops on Monday and they're still here on Saturday afternoon, that's pretty darn good. Uh, yeah, 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 no, you guys are, you guys are super. And, and I was actually uh, speaking to one of the, the um, itinerant speakers who I hope will convert to a regular speaker um, earlier today. And he was saying that it's a, a really great community. Um, people who are, care about this topic and are coming and talking about it and thinking and working hard. It's uh, so again a tribute to uh, to Stuart and and to you uh, for coming and uh, thinking about this and we'll work our collective consciousness. So this afternoon, let's talk about where did it all come from. So our session is entitled. The Origin and the Evolution of Life and Consciousness. And we're going to start with Dr. Bruce Damer of UC Santa Cruz on the origin of life and consciousness. Dr. Damer. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the two Stews, Stuart Kaufman and Stuart Hameroff. Stuart Kaufman had to recommend me last year, and uh, he was doing more of a, an origin of life theoretical biology approach, and that's how I got put together with you, Stu. And thank you very much for this kind offer. Uh, what you're going to see today is actually the first time this work from science has been presented outside of our community. So this is the first time I'm presenting this in an audience where it isn't two-thirds chemists. So this is quite a little bit historic. Uh, I was writing to our, our team last night saying, this is it. This is where we launched this thing. So thank you again. So what I'm going to do also to provide you some grounding, I'm going to pass around an artifact, um, spend a, a few seconds with it. Uh, what this is is stromatolite, uh, some of the oldest evidence for life on Earth. And I'll show, be showing you another during the talk. So feel free in the next 30 minutes to uh, make a connection with it. So uh, off we go. So origin, this is a novel approach to the origin of life. This is the first end-to-end -end scientific theory, a hypothesis testable in the lab for the origin of life from start, uh, from basically from basic molecules to cellular life. It uh, doesn't go beyond that, of course, but it gets, gets you to that point. And it ha possibly has implications for consciousness and everything else. Uh, the disclaimer, uh, this, is, this, was, this wording was assistance from someone here at the meeting helped me with the wording so I could make it more uh, fitting with what you guys are working on. So try to treat this abiogenesis, abiogenesis stochastic cycling, cycling implications seriously, and you'll see the cycle, uh, because it's supported by empirical evidence. We, we, were find, we found an engine that can boot stuff up in chemicals. Uh, but where, the, where it meets the hard problem, the Chalmers hard problem, Please treat this as playful speculation. So what you're about to hold in your hand and what I'm holding in my hand here is uh, new for science. This is some of the oldest evidence uh, for life on Earth, 3.48 billion years old, uh, that was discovered in the Pilbara uh, last summer, last summer field season, and these little Red nodules are stromatolites. They're layers laid down by organisms which, which sequester sand grains together. And then they stack those and they go, grow up on top so they can keep access to the sun. That's the whole name of the game. And they built these rock textures or fabrics, all cones and domes and you name it, and flat pieces. And this is the sole story of life on Earth for about, just about 90% of the time. And this is still the, the bulk of the story of life on Earth were this rarefied thing called complex animal life that popped out maybe for about 2% of Earth's history and will, will, will go away. But microbial life, microbial community is the story of life on Earth pretty much and by bulk. So I'm going to take up not your hard question, but three other hard questions that might be related. How did the non-living world, how did non-living matter animate itself into the living world? One. Why did life bother to come into existence, or did it have a choice? There's your free will for you. And this one, which is very speculative, and I'll, I'm so, I'll be 
quite happy to get critiqued by this group. What is the source of all, an arbiter of all experience? Which somewhere in there is consciousness. So a little bit about me. I have two career paths. One is working with NASA on spacecraft. So there's me at, at NASA. I helped NASA create a whole new architectures for uh, missions to the, uh, to the outer solar system, but to also to the asteroid uh, belt, if you will. This is my design for a human mission to an asteroid. It's the first reference design. I've done about 25 projects for them. This is asteroid capture in a balloon structure and manipulation with gas called Shepard, which is, can also make biospheres. Uh, and do mining and get fuels. And this, is, this single invention by a, a team of three of us has the potential to open the solar system. So this is our current, our current initiative is to find a government program or government private to start running uh, demonstrator flights and, and try to prove this technology to allow uh, human beings to extend the biosphere into the solar system. So that's one aspect of my work. Uh, we're now working on site selection for the next rover. This is the Mars 2020 rover. It comes down on a sky crane. Its pr primary mission is search for life. It's the first NASA mission uh, to search for life uh, on another world, not just do the geology primarily or find the water. And we're, we're arguing with NASA. We're debating, uh, we're trying to convince them to go back to this location. This is a picture taken by the Spirit rover about eight years ago a part of a rock outcrop, which was a hot spring that could preserve life just like this, about the same age. So we have a shot at finding a life on another world if we go back to Columbia Hills, which is where Spirit is sitting, sitting there right now. So rolling back the clock, how did I get in, interested in origin of life? I was raised in Canada, in Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada, and I love to walk in the nature. And I love sagebrush because to me it was like little forests. Like you're flying above forests when you walk through sagebrush. They're like miniature oak trees. And I was walking out in the spring of 1976 and I bent down and there was this beautiful mariposa lily coming up through the ground that had just been frozen. And my little 14 year old brain just flipped and said, how did this structure, how did this beauty emerge? This is a beautiful plant, it's beautiful and there's a bulb or a seed somewhere down under the soil that has instructions to do this. And then I stood up and I realized all the plants are joining some kind of instructions. And then my brain sort of went into hyperwarp speed and I went back and said, well, where did it all start? Did it start with one seed or one instruction? And then I thought, hey, I'm a nerdy kid. I'm a nerd kid in a town with no computers, but I'm a nerd kid uh, and this would be a great problem to work on my whole life. So that's when I committed to working on this problem. And I learned about this fellow, I was reading about uh, Albert Einstein, that at 16 he had thought experiments. He actually had them even earlier, but he had one where he's running alongside a beam of light. And he sort of sees in his Im imagination, it's sort of a delivered vision this guy got at 16 about the compressing of the waves of light and things that led to, to special relativity. So I, I was on the verge of thinking, I could do that when this happened. And I drew this out. Like, in my mind's eye, right in front of me, a thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment started happening. And it was a bundle of molecules. And I didn't even know what molecules were. I knew they were kind of things. I'd read some chemistry uh, articles. And they're moving. And I'm, about, I'm formulating a question. Oh, you can ask thought experiments questions. I'll ask this one. Uh, how did simple molecules sim self-assemble into things that could do things uh, on their own? And instead of getting that question out, it asked me the question, said, figure out how we made a copy of ourselves. Figure out how we made a copy of ourselves. And my little brain flipped and said, well, if you have a TR7 automobile, it's made in a TR7 automobile factory, which is a bigger machine, and I don't see a bigger machine here, so it's impossible and the little bundle of molecules winked. And that's what I've been working on for 30 years. <laughs> so here, here I am 40 years later on the trail of it. So this is me at Bumpus Hell, which is a hydrothermal field up in Mount Lassen National Park. It's actually a very dangerous place to be standing because Mr. Bumpus lost his leg there 150 years ago. What I'm doing is putting a slide tray into a fumarole vent, uh, which has gases coming out. This is the slide tray testing the theory 
that just vent gases alone with humidity could allow us to polymerize an important biopolymer. And it worked. This is the first time it's been done in the field. And this is our gel. And if you see that little blob there, that's RNA. We made RNA without enzymes in a fumarole vent environment. Because our lab goes to these environments and tries to do it in mess the messy chemistry of nature, for goodness sakes. This is what we use in the lab to do that. It's a, it's a device that, that cycles around 24 dishes between hydration and dehydration stations. And we have a 90 Celsius atmosphere. So here's our hydration station, our dehydration station. And we put in reagents that are the building blocks of life, basically. And we can make polymers. We can make the building blocks of life without using life. And this is the first clue to how to do this. Here's our evidence, because our colleagues are very skeptical. They're chemists. They're incredibly hardcore materialist people. So you have to redo this thing right. So here's the gel electrophoresis. And those black bands on the right are uh, our product. We, ha we invented a technology called nanopore sequencing. And we ran it through our own device. And it counts the base pairs as they're going through a pore and gives you little blockades. And you can actually do digital, like analog nature to digital directly. It's a really cool technology. And it worked there. And we blasted it with x-rays to see the stacking order. And then we discovered that we could get these polymers, these biopolymers, inside vesicles, inside lipid. The membranes that actually float in from space actually through dust. They come in and they land on the early Earth. And you got through membrane supply. You got your, your amino acid supply. And some of your building blocks are coming in from space. It's kind of a panspermia, but it's not a fully formed organism. It's just a building blocks. But we proved now it's pretty much in the, in, uh, taken in the field that we can grow polymers this way through basically drying things down and letting the water go away. And you can make these things. It's like nature's way of making biopolymers before life took over. Uh, and they can become encapsulated in these containers. Um, and then you can subject them to selection by their trillions. Now, let's take a look at how this works. So that's the, all the chemistry I'll show you. Uh, let's go to a metaphor everyone in this room understands, uh, computers. So if you're like me in the mid-'70s, your first computer might have been this clunking thing with switches on the front with a paper tape input. I wasn't, it wasn't quite that bad for me. But uh, what, it, what you had to do is punch the program into paper tape. This is how Microsoft started, which was the basic boot, the loader uh, to bootload and then to load the basic language to then run real kind of language. Well, what if you started with a random puncher, but you had an infinite spool that made just zillions and zillions of program tapes, just trillions of them? And they went into a reader. And the reader went into your primitive computer. This is my Altair 8800. And it has an energy source. And it cycles. It'll just try to run those programs. And it's, there's this little processor. And it, there's this little instruction. And they either crash the system. It goes into the crash trash, or it runs, play again. And you get program A. Program A can go back into the random feeder and get added to with, let's try a, a B with that, and C with that, and D with that. Let's just try, 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 try to extend that. Well, over time, you'll develop more functions. You might evolve a computer that will now have a screen and a keyboard if you're evolving both together. Keep going, and you might get to a laptop. Keep going, and you might get to your, your iPhone. So you're, this is a, a model for evolving software and hardware together. The only thing different is that you're doing it randomly. So it takes millions of years. You know? So we hire a cheap form of biology called engineers to do a slightly better job than the random hunter. <laughs> and we get our programs written and things like that. There's no engineers in the audience, right? So this is an inefficient way of booting up a system. But this was the, perhaps the only way that nature had available to it. But it works. This method works. So let's, let's, take a, let's replace this system. Let's go out into the wild and try to find in the world where we could do this. Can, how could nature do this? Well, it's quite simple. The polymerizer is membranes and organics all smushing together, coming in concentrating in pools, and polymerizing. That's what I was doing in Bumpus Hell. I was just doing that. So it makes polymers, which are your tapes, your punch paper tapes. 
Those are fed into a computer called a warm little cycling pool. There's our Charles Darwin, who in 1871 said, I think life started in some warm little pond somewhere. And, it would, and he was extremely prescient. This one little paragraph is extremely right on. Absolutely. So it has a source of energy. It's pumped by a, a geyser system. So what are your programs? They're called protocells. They're random collections of polymers in random little bags of things called lipids, mem lipid membranes. And how, how does your processor work? It's Charlie again, natural selection, a form of early natural selection where he says, oh, that one dislocates and blows up, and this one's fine. This one's more robust because the polymer did something to stabilize, and it kind of like microtubules or cellular structure might stabilize the membrane. Oh, that one can go forward and go again and again and again. Same system. So we put it all together, and this is artwork done for Scientific American, which will be in an article in August issue to uh, announce this to the general, general public. Hot spring origin of life. So here's the big picture. You've got your landscape 4.3 billion years ago, called the Hadean period. You had your volcanoes, your Fred Flintstone volcanoes, and your dirty atmosphere and your chocolate covered oceans and or colored oceans and it's all infused with iron. That's why this, this stone that you're, you're handing around has worked its way around is so heavy. It's, it's full of, of oxidized iron. So we synthesize in the solar system all our building blocks, as I was telling you before. We accumulate them on land in little pools, get our organics, until they get concentrated enough to do chemistry. Because if they go in the ocean, they diffuse. So that's why we're, the field's turned away from an ocean origin now. This can't do it. You can't get chemistry to work. It's very, very difficult in a diffusing, a pregorgene type environment. So then your organics are, are floating along. They're in, the, they're in their, their pools, and you're forming membranes and all kinds of goodies. And they happen to flow down into this optimal pool that's getting filled and draining and filled and draining or filled and drying and filled and drying. And that creates a pump, a natural pump to uh, pump these polymers in through their film phase. This is where they're being written like paper tapes. That's where they're being tested by Charlie Darwin's uh, idea. And then they accumulate in the bottom in this, this gel. That was our big insight. This is our big insight because this gel ends up becoming the common ancestor. It's a new idea for science. So once this gel is, it's just a smush of bubbles that have learned how to adapt and grow. And once they're, they're tough enough, they get washed downstream. They can go to other places. They get blown by wind if they're dry. And they start evolving and adapting. Then they start sharing early genetic functions. And you get the roots of the tree of life. So we found the roots of the tree of life, which is a cool thing. And they start adapting to tough environments like the seashore. Lacustrine environments, this is estuarine environments, and salt just blows you up. If you eat a whole bunch of salty potato chips, you've got to go drink water, right? So we have to learn how to get rid of salt. That's why another reason you can't have an origin in the ocean. You need advanced technology to deal with salt. And once they get to the seashore, they've got all this sand washing over them, so they have to cement those sand drains together, and they create dermatolites at lake shores and at, at oceans. This is so this is a model for the origin of this that is, was so dominant in, in Earth's history and, and will dominate Earth after we're gone. So here's a little view from below. So here's our, here's our little hydrothermal pool. Here's our cycling system. And really, it's all about the cycling. You have to turn the wheel and go through transitions to do this kind of a trick. It's all about the cycling. And you eventually get the progenote the boot up phase of life, which is now becoming a field because we have a model to make these in the lab now. We can grow these in the lab and we, we have a sort of a challenge to different teams. You can make, you can grow these progenotes and they can start booting up the functions of biology. Caveat, uh, this is proto-natural selection for people who study this and it's determined by physics. It's thermodynamic efficiency and statistical mechanics running and it, what it does is pushing entropy out of the system and, and pulling syntropy into it. And it's doing, for those of you who study this kind of thing, this is Stuart Kaufman ideas, it's doing stochastic hill climbing through noisy space till it gets to the adjacent possible. That's a stewism, right? So, uh, but biology comes into this system which is acting like biology, 
It's got to, we got it for free, and it says, I'll replace that with this. Oh, we selected, we found a function to make a pore. We found a function to, to do polymerization without drying down, we'll replace that. We, we, we found a way to make peptides and proteins and more, and it's, so basically it's booting up an OS. This system's capable of booting an OS. And eventually, this keeps running long enough, you get this. And what happens when you get a beautiful rainfall in California, it's been dry for a while, you get an explosion because you have a three-phase system. You have the dry, dry, dry. What's happening in dry? When systems are drying, the plants are getting ready to survive the dry season. So they put all their important polymers inside little capsules called seeds that aren't subject to hydrolysis, and then they, they lie around, and they get blown by wind, they get washed by water. A rainfall event comes, it's a violent event, it distributes things, and then the moist period is when they start their metabolic process. They start sharing, they start generating. And then they get ready to make those polymers again in their punched paper tapes. It's the same thing. So we found a natural setting that is still patterned like a hand and glove onto the world we're around, that's around us. It's still patterned on our bodies. We grow and die based on this pattern. This is, this is what made biology, at least I, purportedly. So three hard questions. How did non-living matter itself uh, come, animate itself into the living world? Cycling. No need for a crater, no need for consciousness, or any other action other than the physics of the universe. Why did life bother to come into existence, or did it have a choice? It just emerged, given the right conditions. So in our quest now to try to find life on Mars, I did a presentation uh, for the JPL and headquarters and big group in Pasadena. I had to do the first talk on the origin of life on another world as in 12 minutes of terror. Just like when the vehicle's coming down, they call it 12 minutes of terror. This is my 12 minutes of terror. 300 people in the room, mostly geologists again. Uh, and literally, hot springs, life emerges in this model. And unfortunately for that life, if it did, Mars is dying. So Mars is warm and wet and then it starts to die. And about 500 million years in, horrible things are happening to Mars. It doesn't have an, a, a magnetic dynamo in its core, so it doesn't have protection of a magnetic field, and there's this immense amount of atmosphere being blown away. And by a billion years in, the oceans are starting to dry up and suddenly disappear. So if life is on Mars, it's like, ooh, this is not a very good place. I have to go for refuge, and that means through the pipes of the hydrothermal field, underground to the salty, wet rocks, and that they're stuck. If there's life there, it's stuck. They can't, they can't evolve very for, much forward. They're stuck in stasis until the sun you know, goes through a red giant and destroys the solar system, or the inner solar system. So it, it could just happen everywhere on these rocky worlds that have exposed land masses and enough feedstock and enough cycling that came from the cosmos. It just could be happening. But it's extremely rare to have complex life, totally incredibly impossibly rare to have complex life, but you've got trillions of exoplanets. The, th the thing is that in order for us to get complex life, these guys had to, the, the reason they're red is because they're generating oxygen and they're fixing the oxygen in a process called rusting, uh, and they're dropping the oxygen down to, to take it out of the atmosphere and the oceans and the, and the water bodies. The, the iron is, is basically getting sequestered because they, if they can, can't do that, then they can't put free oxygen into the atmosphere. So they have to fill the buffer first, and that takes two to three billion years to get an oxygenated atmosphere. And anything can happen to a planet on that time scale. Big impactor resets it, uh, it dries down, et cetera, et cetera. We were fortunate, we went through snowballers, we went through and we got to oxygenation. Then we got to complex cell. To get to us is extraordinarily rare even after that. So the hard questions, uh, this is the one that's made pertinent to this group. What is the source and arbiter of all experience? And this is where I'm going to leap off <laughs> from, from this platform. But it's an interesting platform. Because if you unwind life to its boot up sequence, you can learn about what runs the living world. And what we've discovered is three properties that might have a bearing on what, what you're working on. Uh, and if we can discover those boot up properties, we may discover what consciousness is within the booted up OS. So I had a dream one night, uh, and I dreamt 
uh, I said, wow, we're like at the moment now, we're at the boundary between physics and biology. And for years I've been doing a dance with, I call her, you know, Madre Nature, and saying, I'm getting close. You know, 10 years ago I said, I'm getting close, and I had my box, which is my giant computational simulation engine I built. And she just laughed, a belly laugh. I will not divulge my secret to you without your puny box. <laughs> so I switched to chemistry. Because <laughs> the computer is just woefully inadequate to do this kind of work. So we had to go to chemistry. Now we're getting really close to this. We're getting to the point where we may be synthesizing DNA through self-assembly. We we're getting real close, we think. Uh, so Mother Nature says so back there, she's got her, you know, uh, her frock on, and she's saying, I'm making the cookies, but you're not going to get any, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I'm, this is where I'm doing all my thought experiments, at this boundary. So one night I had a dream, and I saw the pure plane of physics, moving, moving, moving. And then suddenly in the plane opens this divot, it's not like if you're doing golf and you open a divot, it's sort of a pocket. And I look closely, I said, what is going on? Why is it pushing physics back? And I look in there, and there's something going on. And it's just it's the usual protocell, but something going through the membrane, a little molecule there, hitting something there, which decides to do an action. Boop, 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 one of, one of Stu's autocatalytic sets. And I realized if this was not in the membrane, and this didn't pass through in a way, it would never happen. So the story of this part of the dream was, biology takes improbable events and does this magic trip to it, trick to it. It takes them and makes them more probable, more probable, more probable, than it makes them actual. Kind of like quantum mechanics is supposed to do. I, don't ask me. I know nothing about quantum mechanics. Uh, so it's got this property of probability tweaking. On a, and it's a massive scale. Now, physics has the same property, but it takes a long time. It's, it's a cumbersome process. So just after the formation of the first stars, you're not going to see gold atoms anywhere in the universe. They're just impossible because the building blocks aren't there. But after, you know, a few billion years, gold atoms can emerge because there's heavier building blocks than made by stars. So it does the probability thing too, but it's just pretty really cumbersome. But when life starts, all kinds of things happen. So then I was shown in the vision two protocells next to each other, and there was a dip in between them. And the dip was deeper than I thought it would be. And the dream said, watch how this works. And there was stuff flowing back and forth between the dip. It said the connections are deeper than we could suppose in the, the protobiology, in the, in the way to biology. The connections are deep. Then it said, you know, are you sitting down? Because these dreams always say, are you sitting down? I always say, I'm lying down, you know, because <laughs> it's going to scale up. So it scaled up, and it started scaling up to more and more protocells. And like, whoa, this is a huge system. Just this alone. This is now doing more improbable things. Boom, 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 and it's, it's talking about them. Hey, I just did this improbable thing over here. Oh, I did one over here. I'll share it with you. Improbable thing. Boom, boom, boom. This is a powerful system. This is the booting up of the progenote world. We're missing a piece, though. So as it scaled up, these Cartesian plots occurred hanging in space. And I saw these curves. Probability engine going up, connection going up. And then there was this third curve. I was like, what's the third curve? And then it did a funny thing. The dream did a funny thing. It shook the system. And I saw. You know, our good old friend, informational polymer, appear and this like light poured out of the system and it reflected back. Oh, that's pattern. It's invented patterns called information. It's like a pattern ohm. And that's the third element. So then my little brain started throw, rolling its dice and I realized these are deeply connected. There's a probability engine operating which can't be done in physics. There's a connectome operating, not, not a neural connectome, but just chemical messaging that can't run in physics. Uh, and a patternome, which is the first little oligomers of genetic sequence. And it's like, these systems talk to each other rapidly and tightly, and they scale super fast, and they create something super huge. And so even in the progenean, even at 4.3 billion years ago, when you have sludges everywhere, they're barely alive, and they can't even divide themselves, this is a massive, powerful, computational, expressional probability tweaking machine before even the, the formal transmission to life. So what I would put out, put to you or offer to you is that these properties are all you need to explain all phenomena, these three interacting properties. And they generate all observable phenomena. 
they might create all experience if they're like apps, you know, running in this OS called life. And human consciousness, primate consciousness, which is very specific, different from earthworm consciousness, samples only a small fragment of this. And we, we sample it by having, holding a mirror up to another piece of broken glass, to another piece of broken glass, and we're able to sort of see something. But it's all different for all different people. An autistic person would see it a different way, and you know, it, we, all people culturally see different way. An Aboriginal people, person would see it a different way, feel it a different way. And it's all different, it's all relative. So the message of the dream, so usually what happens in these dream experiences, is at the end I get my shirt collar grabbed. Like, you listen and you listen good. You know, I try to get this message through. And the message was, you primates, you monkeys, are only at the very beginning of sensing and studying this field. You're just starting. You should be wary of naming it and modeling it prematurely. It's huge. Uh, because if you come to a molehill and say mountains, we can characterize them, you know, and then there's a mount, there's a hills there, and then there's Himalayas there, you're gonna never go to the mountains, right? You're gonna stick with this old molehill model of everything. Um, the, the one that came into my heart and mind at that point was, wait a minute, maybe we are the exquisite instruments into this field, human beings. Maybe the human being is the greatest instrument ever created by this very process to sense this field. So the people who are working on all the technical parts of the science are using their minds to go into the field and they're using science, but the people who have deep and profound and intimate connections with the world or each other or something we haven't even figured out uh, are also exquisite instruments of, of science or of understanding. We are the best instruments we'll ever make. Human beings, humans' bodies, minds, and hearts are the best instruments, potentially, to work on this thing. So with our cells and our tools, we can explore this field. So in a sense, the dream was inviting us to keep exploring the field. Don't name it so much. Be open to what it teaches you. Learn to speak a common language amongst ourselves so that we don't get all tripped up. Uh, and that one day we may come to a more full knowing of it. But this is a process, this is part of our evolution, but we're exquisite instruments to do this job. So I wanna leave you with this. Uh, everybody pre presents models that maybe can be possibly worked on, and maybe you guys can work on, they call this rotary, rotary roadmap of consciousness or to consciousness. So in this model uh, that I presented to you, the universe is a cycling system it has to cycle, it has to turn. Stars are born, they explode, they reform, they explode. But it tends to be two phases, like a two-phase motor, like a lawnmower can mow the lawn, but not like a three-phase motor that can do, you know, three-cycle motors. So it doesn't have memory, right? It doesn't have a memory. So in our work with our colleagues in physics, they, we're literally coming to the point where like information in physics is more binary. It's, it's not linear, it's not a memory. But we are now, through self-assembling polymers and testing them, we're finding memory in physics, but it steps into toward biology, found that boundary. Uh, so, so you're going from two phases, uh, two phases to three. So, but that system works for billions of years such that the free three-phase cycle can emerge, which has memory. It has bodies. It has an intermediate phase, the progenote, the little sludge. Intermediate phase, it can pick things up, it can learn, do all sorts of things, you know, learn chemically or, or in, innovate, and that animates matter into living systems. Then you get to neural dynamics, and that's a big transition, perhaps. That's the fourth phase in this cycling system that's using all the previous phases. It's like stacked upon stacked upon stacked. And what that means is you, you can have learning in a system, you can have goal directed behavior. That's a new technology. A paramecium can do it ostensibly with just chemical circuits. But when we get nervous systems, we can do it much better. But that's a new phase. How about consciousness? Is this a fifth phase that the whole thing goes through? Dick, 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 dick. Is there something there? Because we, we know those previous phases work. We can characterize them. We can study them. That fifth phase, what is it? What is it? Is it what is it? That's your department, perhaps. So 
I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, these are our, our collaborators on the, the Origin of Life work. And uh, if you have Scientific American, you'll see our, our publication in, uh, in July that, or August, which will introduce it to the general public. Thank you very much. Fantastic. That was worth waiting for Saturday afternoon, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Damer. So, so are you enunciating an imperative for the human species to travel beyond our Earth? Well, I think um, I, I, I dig it. Yeah. I dig it because I Well, think, you work for NASA, right? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like it because it gives us immense perspective. Yes. So, for instance, if we're able to, it takes the, the pressure off the biosphere, too, because a living system is just trying to bust out, and we're the, potentially the reproductive organ. So Gaia is saying, yeah, yeah, take it all, take it all, as long as you do the act and, and you know, the messy act of cell division, right? So cell division's messy. Birth, as all women will know here, it's, it's a messy process, but it's good because you have another. And so if we are the mechanism for Gaia to go forward, because in 100 to 200 million years, the, the sun's on a heat curve, and the Terminator's approaching, right? The, this is in Lovelock's last book. Venus was gobbled up by heat death. I mean, it, atmosphere left and went in the atmosphere, and horrible, it's 900 degrees on the surface of Venus. That's coming to us. Mm -hmm. And Lovelock's calculations are it's 100 million years out. So when that happens, we go to runaway greenhouse, no matter how much or how little CO2 we have in the atmosphere. So it's over for plant, plants on land, it's over for animals. Eventually the oceans will be gone. Microbial life will continue all the way to the heat death of, of, of our planet. But we're at that 1%, 1 to 2% of complex life that, say, a planet like this can sustain. We're coming to the very end of it. So if, if Gaia exists as some kind of a force of nature, uh, she's like, you know, uh, we've got to do this thing. And what that means is getting life out of the gravity well and creating other biospheres. And so Shepard, the design of Shepard can do that because it can encapsulate a large asteroid, melt it down to a rock. Uh, we can introduce biology and we can feed people in space and construct stuff in space. It's a, it's a sailing ship invention for space. It's our imperative to survive. A question here. Are we going to take this one first? What can you say about the implications of your work for the Fermi paradox? Ah, uh, hmm. <laughs> Now that's that's the thing that we, we they should be out there but we don't hear from them. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we're all little green men. I think it's ex I, I think we're I, I did a talk at the SETI Institute where I added four new terms to the Drake equation, uh, which is it was the to to boldly go terms for uh -huh. Star Trek and and Seth Shostak was there so we had a good laugh but it's like it's so extraordinarily rare technological civilizations have done what we what we've done of just. They're so rare, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're just they're they're separated in time and they're separated in space and just never contact them. Next one. The reason why this is relevant is because if we make life more likely to happen to emerge complex life, then we have to account for why we don't see more uh, complex civilizations in the universe. Mm. So how how much of a warning is this for us to pay attention I, to that I issue? Think what this is, as we, as we look back and with the best science we can do, and we find out we're so special, not in church lady special, <laughs> right? But we are incredibly special. We're incredibly precious. The earth is precious. We are precious. We really have to take care of this place and each other. And just like, wow, look, at, <laughs> we're here. And, you know, and we, ha we have a responsibility because of all the effort. I, I sometimes have conversations with these guys. And, when I'm doing mental activity at the progenote level, uh, I say to the smudgy progenotes that are booting up to life, I say, guys, it, it's going to work, we think. Mars, it didn't work out. We're working a little bit of overtime. I don't tell them about all the stupidity that humans do. But I say, <laughs> work the overtime, clean our atmosphere, become life, clean our atmosphere, do all the things, because this one might pan out. And they go, yeah, right. You know, but you know, in a sense, this is your ancestor. This is your ancestor, and we owe it to this system having persisted, whether through will or just through just doing it, just cycling, to, to be, in a sense, honor the incredible uh, labors that this ancestor did, that we could be sitting in a room breathing oxygen and 
eating the ancestors uh, for, for lunch uh, and making technology and, and then asking and then looking back at them, finding them. It's an amazing moment. Next question. Uh, this is a fascinating talk, uh, but for any of this elementary algorithm or whatever you call it to, to work, you need two things. One, you need energy, which is okay, we have them. But what's really needed is a mechanism for the entropy to decrease mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. a, cons con a, a, a consistent way for your entropy to decrease. Where is that mechanism? Uh, through wet drying, wet dry cycling. So, so the wet dry cycle. Wet dry cycles. Well, so, where, how would the entropy be decreased? So you're going. What's hap what happens? You have these films floating in the water, and you have building blocks, monomers. The system dries down, goes from a three-dimensional medium to two-dimensional, and then evaporation occurs, taking all that entropy out. And then between the films, the the building blocks line up, and then water leaves, and they go click, 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 and form a structured polymer, which nature does with ATP. Nature kicks water out with ATP. And so that's where your system undergoes that transition. Sorry? Some positive feedback mechanism. Yeah, and then it cycles again. Okay. It keeps going and going and going. And that's why we're elongating and growing more polymer away from equilibrium. Yeah. So I've read that, that part that you just explained. Peptide bonds don't form well in aqueous solutions. They get destroyed by hydrolysis. So is that how you're saying that works? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And uh, a related question, Jerry Pollock's work with fourth phase of water and ordering, he talks about the exclusion zone being set up by optical pumping. Would that play a role also in the uh, entropy reduction, perhaps, that Dr. Chua was just asking about? It's possible. We don't need it at the moment. Uh, we're, we're dealing, uh, it's possible. And quantum effects could be possible in this era, epoch, too, because ultraviolet uh, light uh, we think that the first pigments were polycyclic compounds, and that would involve some kind of quantum effect to turn that into an energy source, because this early life can't stop just being dependent on the fast food outlet of the hydrothermal field. It eventually has to make its own food, and that's a, a huge transition for, for the progenote world to, to do photosynthesis. And it's not going to be with chloroplasts. It's going to be with something much simpler, and that's where, where some of the quantum effects might come in. Quick question, two quick, two last quick questions. Okay, first one is just a comment. If you're curious about the Fermi paradox, Google, they are made out of meat. It's a great little movie. Okay. Yeah, um, because they're not here because we're made out of meat and that's what intelligence is not made out of anymore. It's all made out of metal and silicon. Anyway, um, I've had this argument with several um, creationists who make the point that if you take the time at which the sun uh, first started to fuse and the time at which we have evidence of life um, in the rocks, it's a very short time. It's a surprisingly short mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And they make the argument that it's too short. Mm -hmm. But I've read a couple of papers that say that um, it's quite possible that protogenotes may in fact evolve in the interstices in rocks, essentially asteroids. Um, have you encountered that argument? And we, if you have, looked, what do you think of it? The chemistry only takes you so far. So the building blocks are going to be forming in the solar system accretion disk, especially as the sun heats it. And then they come in the mm. atmosphere. Now here's a fun one for you guys. We can now do the numbers on this thing because of what the comment was back here about peptides breaking down in water. So we know the outer bounds of which we make a nice peptide, it gets encapsulated, it cycles back. It's got to do it in, in probably hours to days. There's no refrigerator for us to put our stuff in. So we have outside bounds. We have a box. Like progenotes have to cycle at X rate and it's hours to days. It might be minutes, like 23 minutes like old faithful or 73 minutes filling and et cetera, or through dew cycling, through day-night cycling. It's fast. So we can get to progenotes that, potentially something that starts to evolve and adapt and then fails many times and in many places uh, on, on a, um, ancient Earth. 
And so there can be starts and failures, starts and failures, starts and failures, starts and failures. And how we get over that, the big gap, how we cross those huge evolutionary gaps is that something started inventing something cool, but it's dying because of all the waste product buildup. Wind comes and blows a piece of it to the next pool and shares that innovation with something else that has something else. And we have horizontal gene transfer, the roots of the tree of life. So that system can stay ahead of its ricketiness. You know, and a huge asteroid hits the Earth, washes an entire island over with a thousand foot tsunami, that's fine. The cataclysm will wash the system out and allow the few remaining protocells to start again. So it's, it, this is why I don't believe in panspermia, because you know, life is so hand in glove with this planet. It, it grew up with it, it changed the planet, it created new minerals, for goodness sakes. We create minerals, you know, our cell phones are phonite. You know, our, our brain case is a mineral that contains a liquid crystal mineral called the neural structure. And one last point for you guys. So I'm standing around with geologists and I said, okay, let's do a thought experiment. We'll build a time portal. We can, you can walk through it and go to 4.3 billion years with your space suit and your environment suit and everything. And we'll go to these pools. And we, we go to the pools and we see the sludge in the bottom of the pools. The geologists would say, that's just sort of a mineral effusion sludge. The biologist said, that's, that's kind of interesting because it's kind of growing. So we come back a hundred years later and the sludges are in all the pools and some of them have turned black. And the geologist said, minerals don't turn black on their own. Well, let me, and the biologist, let's pipette that thing, put it in our sequencer. Oh, there's a little short oligo of some RNA-like thing or DNA-like thing and there's a lot of them in there and they're making black pigment to shield the whole community collectively uh, and, and introduce photosynthesis. So this is where geology and biology separate. Geology used a hard mineral, uh, hard minerals to make their forms. Biology used soft minerals that could learn how to make their own solutes and keep growing and building. And here's the last piece for you guys, uh, sort of an extension of the talk. Here's the beautiful thing for philosophy from this. We didn't start from competing protocells. Hmm. We started from a collaborative community unit. It's a network like the internet where every part is contributing to the whole. This could be proved by science in less than 20 years because we could be growing these things in science and we'll see them fill the dishes and then if they crash down, they could do time lapse and they, they grow again, they've responded to stress, we pipette that and we find that they've done undergone molecular evolution. There could be competitions all over the world to to do this protobiology, but it will, it'll be like seeing the Earth from space from Apollo 8, you know that beautiful image? Seeing this is probably how we came into being, and it's a, and it's a struggle, it's, it's, you know, it's like go team go, you know, because these things are fragile, they fail all the time, but they're collaborating and they're reaching up, so when we hit them with hard ultraviolet, they respond and they turn black, we go, wow, this is our ancestry. It'll, we'll rethink our civilization at that point. Certainly our political, political economy, think we, we should. So anyway, that's where this rolls into philosophy. Very last quick question. Well, I was gonna ask the question, what was the first self, you know, truly self-replicating thing? But I think what you're saying is there was no such thing, that there wasn't an individuated self-replicating right. thing. It that's was. There that, couldn't have that, been. That's a stupid question to ask. And that's where it goes to creationism again, because they talk about this as being the ir you know, irreducible thing. Well, you don't have to have it. So the, the little bundle of things, the bundle of molecules when I was 14 that winked, like, ah, you work on it. When I saw it in December of 2013, I, I was doing yoga and breath work, and I went into a reverie, and I was the protocells. I was this, for two and a half hours, I was running the thought experiment. I ran upstairs, wrote to Dave, Dave Diemer, my colleague at UCSC, did the drawing, and he wrote back, you found it, you found the kinetic trap, you found the mechanism. And the beautiful thing about that is it's solved, the wink was solved. So I could say back to the, the dancing molecules, it was little machines all working together that lift in an environment. And out of that environment, that niche, that could come more complex machines that one day could divide on their own. But they did it only within the context of the community to support them. So the whole thing, that, that's the whole basis. You can't do things without a community support around you. Right. And that, that could be shown at the cell, at the protocellular level. And you heard it here first. Thank you so much, Dr. Damon. <laughs>